All right, today's lecture will be on the plow. And you'll notice that I called it Aldo's Tools, and this is the plow. So he articulated five tools that we're going to go through in all of these lectures. It would definitely be wise of you to be able to name or select those tools from the list. So this is going to be the plow. This picture that you're looking at right here is uh, a pretty telling image and if you understand uh, based on this Im image a few principles about plant ecology and how they interact with different types of disturbances I, th I find that it helps you understand how you can use the plow uh, to manage habitat or or to uh, you know favor particular plant species depending on what your objectives are so the two plants that you see in here, one of them is an annual, it's annual wheatgrass. That is the left side of each of these. Notice there's not even a plant in September. And then the left plant under December is the annual. The perennial wheatgrass uh, is the one on the right. You'll notice that it has a very well-developed root system compared to the annual wheat, okay? This is a really important uh, distinction to make between annuals and perennials. And if you can understand this, uh, it should basically lay, lay the, the groundwork for you to understand how to use disking. So annual plants, you remember they germinate from seed, produce a flower and a seed, and then die all in one growing season. The perennial plants, by design, are trying to stick around for a long time. So there are a couple of things that, that happen. One, the annual plant tends to invest much less in root system, as you're seeing in this image, and much more into seed production. So if you so there are some genera that there are two species within the same genus, one of which is an annual and one of which is a perennial. When that occurs and we compare the seed production year to year, the annual will far outproduce the perennial in terms of how many seeds it produces. So that's a pretty valuable characteristic for things that eat seeds, right? So we'll get into that here in a few minutes, but that's uh, something that you need to understand is that the annual plants invest less in roots and more in seed production than perennials. This picture is really telling because it's showing you that the investment can be far different even on plants that are pretty similar uh, in terms of their, their uh, genetically similar. So the wheatgrass in this case has invested a tremendous amount in its root system and it, it's trying to accomplish several things by doing that, right? It, it needs to, it's going to invest less year to year in seed production and it's really banking on longevity and that root system helps it to uh, persist over many growing seasons. So it's just a difference in strategies between these plants. So now think about between these plants, which one do you think would respond really well to disking? If you said the annual, you were correct. And the primary reason is these perennial plants have taken so much time and put so much energy into the production of the root system that if you come through with a disc, uh, if you don't know what a disc is, go look that up real quick so that you can understand what that implement looks like. I'm gonna talk about it a, a couple of times in this lecture and then uh, during the field component, you'll get to see some firsthand. But a disc is essentially breaking up the soil and in a, when you pull it through a plant community, what it will effectively do is sever the plant. So these perennial plants it will sever the root system from the top. Because these perennial plants are relatively slow to colonize, especially uh, if they've been severed from their root system. So uh, because of that disturbance, the annual plants tend to be favored when you disc. Okay, they are, there are a lot of those seeds just sitting around the seed bank. They often 
uh, have seed dispersal mechanisms that allow them to arrive very quickly after disturbance. You'll, you'll uh, talk about that with David Mason in that lecture. So uh, they tend to colonize and do really well after soil disturbance, uh, such as disking, whereas these perennials, the growing point of the plant is actually uh, right at the soil surface for grasses or a little bit above it for forbs. And when you sever that, you basically kill the plant, unless it has one of those uh, root system adaptations that we talked about uh, you know, like a rhizome or stolons, they can't withstand the, the root system being severed. That being said, the couple of perennial plants that are problematic, uh, we'll go through several of them in the class, that have rhizomes and stolons, they actually can respond to disking pretty well because you essentially just chop the plant up into a whole bunch of of new plants because each root you know segment that you sever has its own bud that it can grow from so that's a different kind of thing in general disking is going to favor annual plants over uh, perennial plants okay so you've heard me talk about early succession quite a bit and old field communities quite a bit so far and here, I love this image because it is depicting some really important things uh, about old field communities or early succession or native prairie. Uh, the, you know, some of these plants would be mixed into uh, prairie. But uh, the early succession in general, high quality intact early succession is a limiting factor for many wildlife species in in the eastern United States just in general. So when we look at this segment of the of the plant community, they're probably probably the first thing, especially after the previous slide, that you might notice is many of these plants have extremely extensive uh, root systems. So a lot of these are perennial plants. There's forbs and grasses in this. If you look at the far left, that Kentucky bluegrass on the far left, notice how poorly developed that root system is comparatively. That is a non-native pasture grass, and we have Bahia grass would be the most common probably in this state, but that we have imported a whole bunch of pasture grasses that uh, they, they don't do things the same way that a lot of our native plants would in, in native grasslands. Okay, so one of the things that's starkly different that you're seeing is the root system development. So in, especially in prairie systems in the southeast, a lot of the time the, uh, that system is really prone to drought. So one of the strategies of a lot of these plants is to grow root systems deep enough in the soil to reach the water table so that they can withstand drought. Another thing that they are doing in the process is they are sequestering an enormous amount of carbon. Our non-native improved pasture grasses that we use for grazing systems do not do that nearly as well. All right, and you're, you're seeing why right now by looking at this, uh, at this graph. Another thing that is extremely important from a wildlife standpoint, and the reason that I have this photograph in the bottom right, is the structure that has been created by the native plants in our systems. So if you look at each individual plant, there's quite a bit of interstitial space at the ground level between plants. So essentially, when you mix, especially if you have a balance of about half of the biomass or perennial grasses, like the, the uh, big blue stem, for instance, you can kind of see right there in the, in the middle. Uh, when you have a mix of those perennial native warm season grasses with our native forbs, we tend to have a lot of that interstitial space that's providing an overhead canopy for little small animals like birds and and uh, small mammals and things. And that, that community structure is absolutely critical. 
that you know uh, for quail or for turkeys that are brooding a whole suite of non-game avian species that are associated you know especially the early succession obligates many of them are need this kind of structure that's being created we have a lot of bare ground that where you know poults or or uh, the uh, smaller bird species can forage uh, along the ground and it's providing overhead protection from predators but also uh, one of the things that some of the emerging literature shows that that is providing a thermal buffer so not only uh, if they're born early in the spring could they be sensitive because they're poor at thermoregulating so poults or or chicks or whatever uh, they're they're poor at thermoregulating so uh, if they're doing that early in the spring that could be a threat from getting too cold and a little bit later in the year you know midsummer it's a threat to get too hot in fact there have been some studies uh, with the pasture grasses where we've actually turned uh, quail chicks loose in it and they die of heat stress within an hour all right less than an hour they can't they literally just cannot function in that type of, of system uh, turkey poults when they get up three or four weeks old they can deal with it okay although it's not producing the insect uh, biomass that these native plants would but that structure is really the critical thing for wildlife habitat that we're trying to promote with this when you're promoting this type of plant community with fire and disking we tend to reduce the amount of thatch on the ground so you have a lot of bare soil at that ground level with all this interstitial space we'll see this out in the field quite a bit but i wanted you to be very clear on on uh, this structure being the primary thing the insect biomass is, is secondary you know the rule number one for these animals is don't die right so the imminent threats are heat or some sort of thermal stress for for young and then predation and it's protecting them from those two things they need to be able to to move freely at the ground level think about a quail right after it's born uh you know they're like little bumblebees they need to be able to freely walk through all of that and their requirement requiring really high insect production because of the high skeletal growth rate and the the uh, production of feathers they have to be eating high biomass of insects this kind of plant community particularly the forbs in it that are really high quality produce a high amount of insect biomass for eating uh, the other thing is the forbs are primarily driving the fruit and seed production that are being eaten by a lot of these species so the forbs really are providing the food and some of the overhead cover and the grass is providing some of the overhead cover uh, and maybe providing some of the nesting material if they're you know some species will nest at the base of them a quail do that a couple of songbirds will use the the uh, grass for that and then the grass is also extremely flammable so it promotes fire moving through the system all right so i know i've been talking about fire a lot and that's because it was one of the natural disturbances that was an important part of this and i'm about to show you how that actually interacted with the thing that was like disking so but first i want you to think about in this system what which plants would you expect to respond well to disking probably not a large majority of these right that all have the gigantic root systems they would not be favored and uh, one thing I don't like about this graph is there aren't any of the annual plants that might be common in here uh, the closest one would be that pearl purple coneflower in the center uh, but there are quite a few annual plants in this system that would respond really well most of the ones you see on here uh, would not uh, be favored by disking so uh, here's another picture showing you the kind of structure that we're talking about on that previous slide so the plants 
uh, kind of in the top and right corner. Those are native warm season grasses. You can see we would also call them a clump forming grass. And uh, the reason is because all of the stems are originating from the single base and they tend to go up and sort of umbrella out. Uh, the left side of the picture of that image, that is a, a native form called sumpweed. And if you look in the center on the bottom of this picture, you can see a bunch of bare soil. So this is the kind of structure that we're looking for. Uh, for a lot of these ground foraging early succession species like northern bobwhite. Uh, I thought it also may be interesting for you to see how closely these kinds of characteristics uh, match some other processes like the, uh, the map that you see, that heat map on the bottom right. That is actually the mean fire return interval uh, the natural fire return interval for the United States. And notice the red and orange and yellow. That all means that fire is occurring relatively frequently. So the northern bobwhite range is that purple map kind of up in the, the uh, right corner, the upper right corner of the screen. Notice how closely it resembles the frequency of fire. When fire is occurring frequently, a lot of these early successional obligated species like northern bobwhite fare really well. I'm showing you northern bobwhite data because we have excellent data on that species, but other early successional obligates would look very similar to this, where they are occurring uh, basically in association with fire. And uh, I, I, I think that, first of all, that's just really cool. But second of all, uh, it shows you how important that process is. And one of the reasons that we're focusing so much on fire in this, I mean, this lecture literally is supposed to be about disking and I'm still having to focus on fire to show you these relationships as a part of it. That's just a, you know, a telltale sign for how important fire is. And one of the reasons is because it promotes this kind of structure that you're looking at in this picture, both in, in prairie or early succession, but also in open forest systems. Okay, so let's switch gears and start thinking about disking in this same context. So I have intentionally talked about the uh, early successional systems and then linked it to fire to, you know, leading you up till this point. All right. So this is a bison hoof. And I just want you to look at the hard angle on it. It's fundamentally different from a cow's hoof, which many of you may have seen, or, or a horse. Uh, they're, you know, those are more flat. The, the bison has a really hard, harsh angle on that, all right? So they're essentially a one-ton lawnmower, right? They're eating plant biomass, running around on four shovels, and they're turning all of that nutrient, all of those plants into nutrients, and then spreading it out the other end, right, as fertilizer. So think about that for a minute. We have this one-ton animal. They are usually traveling in huge herds or they did back in the day when there were a lot of them. So we'd have this huge herd of herbivores running around, churning up the soil. Another thing that was really important about their interaction uh, with the landscape is they follow fire, okay? So think about why that might be. So, uh, this bottom right graph here is uh, pretty important as well. If you look at the distribution of fire, the white bars are when fires actually get ignited by lightning. So this is actual data from across the, the uh, eastern United States. Those are actual fires over the last 30 years that were ignited by lightning. Notice that it peaks in May, starts peaking in May, 
really peaks in June and July. That's the top of it. And then we still have a fair amount in August, but then the number of fires drops off precipitously and stays pretty low throughout the winter months. For Florida, Specifically, if you start going down in, into central and southern Florida, a lot of the fire would, it, it would probably shift the May bar up a little bit and the July bar down a little bit just because of the rainfall patterns, but it's still pretty similar to this. Now look at the gray bars. That is when humans like to light fire. These are actually prescribed fires where people went out and used it to manage uh, plant communities and they may have had different objectives a lot of times we're lighting it to reduce fuel but you may uh, have also added or uh, used fire to manage wildlife habitat or they may be doing some combination of those things or, or a variety of other things but the big point here is if you mathematically try to compare those curves they're almost as far different as they can be mathematically. We don't like to light fire, even prescribe fire, when we're trying to manage ecosystems and mimic lightning fire, we still mismatch that intentionally. And there's a variety of reasons. We'll discuss this a lot in, in uh, the discussions. Uh, there's a lot of reasons why we might do that, but uh, there's some pretty important implications of this. So let's go back to the bison. We've got this, this gigantic herbivore running around with shovels that's going to churn up the ground and they follow fire. Historically, that fire would have occurred mostly in the midsummer, not all of it, but a lot of it would have occurred in the midsummer. So you have fire happen. Remember all of those perennial plants that were associated with the grasslands so they have this really well adapted root system to withstand being top killed by fire. So you remember how I told you the, the growing point of the plants were kind of right there at the ground level. They're protected pretty well from fire and fire will just top kill the plant and then it will use all of that carbon that's being stored in its roots and put it back into growth and re-sprout and it does really well. It, that's a great adaptation for it. The other thing that it withstands really well is herbivory. So you have fire that goes through the system and all these perennial plants that are already established, they have the competitive edge in that system. And without a giant herbivore uh, running around with shovels, what will happen is if you repeatedly burn, you end up uh, really favoring native perennial plants because they withstand fire really well. And a lot of our, our uh, herbivores that are still in the system. But when bison were in the system, it was a, it kind of shifted favor a little bit because of this hoof action, all right? So essentially we have this giant herbivore that was following fire. The fire would uh, basically remove the biomass and all of those re-sprouting plants they actually are very high quality. The, the quality of that forage is substantial compared to the same plant if it had not been burned. That is what leads to the attraction by the herbivore. The term for that interaction would be called pyric herbivory or pyric herbivory, all right? P-Y-R-I-C herbivory. And basically all that means is fire-driven herbivory. So where fire occurs, you have this re-sprouting and that attracts the herbivores. Back in the day, we had these herds of bison that were following it around. Uh, the historical range of bison went all the way down into central Florida. Uh, we'll talk about that quite a bit more when we go into the match, uh, elders tool to match. But uh, it's important for you to understand this ecological context when we're thinking about why disking works, all right? So we've got this community that we've gone in and burned, and then bison would come in and forage there. When they actually 
uh, eat that foliage from the plants. They keep setting it back. Basically, you know, you eat all the biomass of the plant and the plant responds by growing more biomass from the carbon that it has stored in the roots. It has to capture light, right, to, to uh, continue to grow so, and, and uh, store nutrients and everything to complete its life cycle. So what happens is fire initiates what we would call what the term for it is a grazing lawn and essentially what that means is once that process is initiated the herbivores coming in and continuing to remove biomass will lengthen that resource pulse that you'd get from all the the uh, plant regrowth that's really high quality as the herbivores crop it off it will continue to grow more and more and that would have lasted all the way into the fall until basically the end of growing season so that there's a, that's an important process but the main thing for you to understand is not only were the the herbivores suppressing the perennial plants but that hoof action was severing a lot of those plants and disturbing the soil after the fire and what would have you know the things that would have colonized uh, all of that soil disturbance, especially with uh, a lot of those root systems being severed from the perennial plants, are a lot of annual plants and particularly annual forbs, which we have just talked about how important they are for food production and the structure in that system. Okay, so ecologically, it's a really awesome association between all of these processes and species affecting the way the system functions. Now, obviously we don't have bison anymore, but disking can mimic that hook, hoof action really well. In fact, here is your bison right here, this tractor, that is a disc that's this hooked up as the implement to that. So it's exactly what it sounds like. It's a bunch of circular discs that are designed to dig into the ground and you can see what's happening in this prairie. So I get asked this all the time, uh, you know, people are using fire to try to manage these plant communities and they're repeatedly using it over and over, sometimes for decades, right? And I commonly get the question, well, all I have is a whole bunch of native orange season grass and I don't have any forbs, how do I get the forbs? Well, here it is. So if you disc during the fall in that system, look at the picture on the right, the strip that you're seeing here is where it has been disced. The reason that it is green instead of that, that light colored brown is because that is primarily forb biomass. Now native annual forbs have responded to that. So there are a couple of things for you to understand here that are really important. Remember the timing of the interaction of the herbivore and fire. Fire peaked in the summer, and then the herbivore would have initiated that grazing lawn, and that would have lasted through the fall. A lot of that hoof action would have occurred during the fall months. If we disc in this system during the fall, that will promote a lot of hard seeded plants that over winter really well. Okay, so I said hard seeded. So a bunch of those seeds from our native annual forbs have what they're hard seeded. And basically what I'm, what I mean by that is they can seed bank, they over winter really well. So they colonize really well after a fall disturbance and anything that is self seeded that basically can't, it can't overwinter nearly as well. And we tend to not see those that's important because a lot of our non-native plants that were undesirable are soft seeded plants. So if you time the disking during the fall, just like the historical interaction between what, you know, the fire and the herbivore that we're trying to mimic the hoof action of, if you mimic that timing, you end up with a bunch of native plants. Okay, so we're gonna see things like uh, common ragweed that will dominate this area you know that's an annual form that provides really good uh, structure and high quality nutrition for herbivores and uh, a lot of biomass of insects and seeds and that seed can literally sit there in the seed bank waiting on this disturbance 
for hun over a hundred years, uh, we know for a fact. So there, there are, there's a seed bank of, of great stuff sitting there in this system. All right. Another thing that it's a good opportunity to talk about is notice how they, we have this narrow strip here. Well, in general, uh, we don't want to create too narrow of, of a path, right? So uh, if you think about this field, let's say the whole field is in agriculture. Uh, let's say it's a, in a cornfield. Well, if we had just a narrow strip of really high quality cover that was, you know, a few yards or maybe 10 yards wide, let's say, along that edge, uh, even though it would be high quality from the perspective of many wildlife that want to use it, because it's such a narrow, narrow linear feature, we tend to see some negative effects on some of those wildlife species, uh, particularly ground nesting birds will see increased nest predation because the feature is really easy for predators to hunt. All right, so they would still use it, but that would be an ecological trap in that case. So we're trying to avoid that, but in this situation, uh, we can use this strip disking in the field. You know, it's a different context. It's not a narrow strip of usable space next to a a lot of unusable space like the agriculture example. In this case, all of this space is, is usable, but we're trying to use the strip disking practice in this case to just increase the amount of forbs in the uh, community, all right? So that would be a practice that we might use. It's not really creating that same ecological trap problem. We'll talk about this a lot more during the class, but uh, it's not the same kind of situation, but it is a good image for you to think about uh, some of these things and how we could create a, a problem if we don't do it uh, in the appropriate design. All right, so uh, it, when, when fire and the soil disturbance with that large herbivore are interacting, what we end up with is a balance in the plant biomass between the native perennial particularly grasses and uh, the native annual, particularly forbs, all right? So perennial native grass and native annual forbs would be, a, you know, a fairly balanced biomass and that's what we can use disking to accomplish in this system. All right, so we're gonna talk a little bit about using disc and wetland systems as well because that's a another important practice that we use really commonly but I want you to be very clear uh, that we're trying to do slightly different things based on the targeted suite of species that we that we're trying to promote so in this upland system we are primarily using disking to promote annual forbs all right, the practice will decrease the dominance of perennial grass and increase the relative dominance of annual forbs. That is different than the wetlands, which is why I'm being so specific here. And you will be asked about this on the quizzes and exams. So make sure that you understand what I just said. Okay, so uh, here's another example of the disking. You can see the soil on the left side how it's been churned up. In this case, it's in a field that had, uh, had been burned recently. Notice uh, the trees in the background don't have leaves on it. And I, I wanted to show you this for a couple of reasons. One, uh, it shows you, it kind of gives you a mental image of how it's breaking up the soil. But two, uh, this is already, you know, really late in the year, it's probably November or December when a lot of the plants have already gone dormant. All right, if you look on the picture on the right, you can see that disc strip. That plant that is in there, uh, in that disc strip, that is actually common ragweed, just like I was talking about a few minutes ago. We've increased the relative dominance of the annual forb, in this case, uh, that one, that's not the only one, but that just happens to be what's dominating this image. Uh, 
but that's how we have increased the forward production in that grassland. Now, obviously, uh, we, we probably didn't make a very big impact in this particular case because it's just one strip, but it shows you what I'm talking about by increasing the, the prevalence of that annual. Another thing that's important about this is the disking, you know, you'd want to target it in the fall, but as long as there's a, a few week period before green up and, you know, the longer the better, but as long as there is a, a period of dormant season where plants aren't yet actively growing, the disking will promote the, uh, the native plants primarily. If we move the disking around to late, you know, uh, late in the spring or early in the summer, like a, a April, May, June time frame, we will benefit soft seeded plants, and you'll end up with a bunch of nasty stuff, a bunch of non-native plants that we do, uh, that we would not want to use. All right, another thing that's really important about this that this practice can be controversial. And uh, the reason that people get bent out of shape about it, especially uh, plant ecologists, is this is not a practice that you would want to use in an old, uh, old growth situation. So if you're in a landscape where it's old growth and there's never been any agriculture on it, the soil structure is still all in uh, you know, historical reference conditions, uh, you would not ever want to take tractor, a tractor in there because you'll cause a lot of problems in the soil that we wouldn't want to do. Here's the problem with that. We're, I'm uh, trying as part of this class to take you to an old growth site and uh, it's one of the only ones I've ever seen. It is extremely uncommon that that is the case. It is very common that we have uh, most of the landscape has a, the timber has been harvested before and or it's been in agriculture at some point in the past and that ship has already sailed. So in those cases, the disking, you know, with the tractor, we're not really uh, causing any of those same issues that we could in old growth because it's already, that's already happened. Uh, in this case, we can use it to promote a suite of plant species that are associated with old fields that could be really positive, all right? So you may hear people being down about disking and, you know, if we were in those kinds of, of sites, I would never uh, recommend using disking uh, because we're trying to maintain the, that natural, uh, soil conditions and plant community and a lot of plants in those those old reference communities are ex extremely rare and uh you know disking would not be favorable in those circumstances so i just wanted to make that clear you know this isn't a fix all in all circumstances there are situations that you would not want to use it all right Okay, so I just wanted to show you some data from field studies that have been done uh, using this. So the top graph right here, uh, the WS means warm season grass, and you can see the strip disking and uh, whether it's spring or fall will reduce the cover of the native warm season grass. The herbicide bush hogging is basically just mowing it or the dormant season fire does not really affect the coverage of it. The big difference between the spring and fall disking is on the bottom graph. You can see the desirable forbs tend to respond uh, pretty well to both of those, but we end up with a lot of undesirable, that red color, we end up with a lot of undesirable plants in the spring uh, disking that we would not have in the, following the fall disking. So here uh, I'm showing you data on the percent cover of forbs based on disking at different times. Notice uh, the December all the way through March, this was in the Mid-South by the way, so in March it's still before growing season. We uh, end up with a lot of good 
or a high coverage of Forbes. The April is getting a little bit too late and we don't have desire, as much desirable Forbes and uh, all of these are relative to a control that is not disking at all. Okay, so here it's just showing you the uh, undesirable warm season grasses. Again, the disking in the late time of the year increases the uh, prevalence of those species. Here showing you just an image of that. The plant on the right, the red that's sticking up, that is a non-native grass that's called Johnson grass. And it is one that is, it's a perennial but it is favored particularly by that, that early spring uh, disking. You'll see a lot of that. Notice we still have some good stuff. This is ragweed and a bunch of native warm season grasses kind of mixed in, balanced, but we have the presence of this non-native undesirable plant. Uh, and it, it's one that has a rhizome and it responds, even though it's a perennial, really well to disking, particularly at that time of the year when you chop up the root system and all the those little fragments that of roots that have buds on each individual one if they don't have to overwinter they respond really well to that so on the left you can see uh, we did that in the mid middle of december and all of the plants that you can see in there are desirable native plants all right so let's switch gears a little bit and talk about some moist soil uh, disking so um, we really commonly uh, in moist soil management, and that's a, a term, okay? I'm not just uh, telling you a particular situation. That is actually an actual term for a management strategy. It's called moist soil management. And uh, we do this pretty commonly where we're managing water levels for waterfowl and uh, a, a lot of different water birds that, that will be associated with that, but particularly for waterfowl that are uh, being hunted, we would implement disking in a wetland that we're managing the water in to promote some plants and uh, the, you know a bunch of these uh, grasses that you're seeing on the screen here, or grass-like in the case of the chufa. Uh, so one thing that is very important for you to understand is we're using disking in this moist soil management context to promote annual grasses. All right, that's, the, that's very different than uh, disking in the upland where we're trying to promote annual forbs. Okay, so make sure that you get those things straight in the moist soil, the bottomland situation, we are targeting waterfowl, which eat seeds from annual grasses and particularly uh, the annual grasses because they produce such high volumes of high quality seeds, right? Relative to perennial grasses, they produce far more seed. And that, that's what we are trying to uh, promote. Barnyard grass, uh, is one that's really good that we see a lot. That's uh, wild millet. But uh, in the picture on the right, you see smartweed. That is an annual smartweed in that picture. That's an, another case where we have annual and perennial smartweeds and the annuals produce far more seed. Both of them have desirable seeds for waterfowl. It's just the annuals produce so much, so much more because they invest in seed production rather than uh, root production. The panic grass in the bottom right, you can see that the seeds are kind of wispy, right? They're, they're tiny little seeds, but it's producing so many that, uh, that, that they're really valuable for waterfowl. Okay, so in, with disking, in both cases, we are trying to promote annuals and discourage perennials. But in the wetlands, we want grasses, annual grasses, whereas the, the uh, uplands, we want annual forbs. That's what we're trying to promote with disking. All right, so I just, uh, I, I see this confuse people on the, the test questions pretty commonly. So I'm just trying to be very explicit to you on, on what we're trying to accomplish here. 
So these are all good ones. It'd be a good idea if you could name a couple of, of uh, these desirable plants. Some of the undesirable plants that you might get in the moist soil uh, situation would be these on the uh, screen now. These are, are uh, undesirable for a variety of reasons. One, they don't produce much seed. That the In the case of the sickle pod, that one's actually a really important plant because it is a legume and it has a toxin associated with it that the sickle pod does. And because it's a legume, it's actually really important in agriculture for soybeans because it has a secondary plant compound and uh, you should probably be able to pick this out of a lineup. It is called anthraquinone, all right? Anthraquinone. So look that up, a uh, sickle pod has that in it and it is toxic to people. And because of that, and because it's a legume, just like our soybeans are, it's a big weed problem. Because if we go in and harvest soybeans that have a bunch of sickle pod in the field, that gets mixed in with the soybeans. And particularly uh, when we're producing the oil that we use from, uh, from soybeans, uh, if it has anthraquinone in it, it is toxic to us. So there's been actually a, a whole uh, line of research trying to figure out how to neutralize or extract anthraquinone from our soybean oil. So it's been really important to us, but same thing for wildlife, uh, that anthraquinone is really good at protecting the plant from things to eat it, that chemical defense. And because of that, it doesn't have any wildlife value. Uh, it's not something that you want to see in your uh, wetlands, but it can colonize really quickly. Cockleburr, it has a seed that uh, that disperses itself by sticking in fur. So uh, you should probably know what that dispersal strategy is after you watch David Mason's presentation, but uh, it's really annoying if you've uh, ever been in a wetland and you got these stuck all over you. They're very annoying, uh, but it also doesn't have much wildlife value. There, There isn't anything that eats that seed anymore. There, there actually is an extinct species that used to eat it. But uh, in particular, these weeds and particularly cockleburr become a problem either when you're not disking at the right time or when the water levels are being managed incorrectly. The cockleburr, that one seems to really show up if you lower the water. You know, we're, we're talking about a, uh, we have water control structures in, in the systems where we can actually dictate how much water is in. And uh, in some cases there are even pumps where we can pump water into it. But uh, so if we let the water out of the system really quickly, then uh, we tend to end up with stuff we don't like, especially cockleburr, all right? So another thing that's very different about this system, and I think uh, we can move on to the next slide when we talk about it, uh, I th something that's different in this system is, you know, the waterfowl are using the wetland through the winter and into the spring, and then we'll start drawing the water off. And then we would want to disc, you know, as soon as it's dry enough. So that'd be an early summer generally, uh, it may vary a month or two, depending on where you're at. But that, you know, it's, we're not waiting till the fall. And the reason is we're trying to promote seed production in a bunch of these annual plants, and they need time to get to seed. Right, so in this wetland, uh, you know, as soon as it's dry enough, we would disc, and then, uh, you know, before we flood it, we would want, you know, at least eight to ten weeks, and probably even a little bit longer before we would uh, allow water to flood the system again. So we're, you know, we're thinking early summer, and then we're going to start flooding it again, maybe in in September, October. You know, uh, quite a uh, quite a bit of time has elapsed and plenty of time for many of these plants to, to go to seed. Another thing that we uh, would be thinking about in this system is you, you want to associate different kinds of structure in it, right? We're trying to 
to maximize the, the uh, availability of different habitat components. Think about it that way for the uh, species that are using this. So you see uh, in this top right picture, we have open water, a lot of foraging will go on, and then you have some standing structure uh, they're kind of in the background and that is providing really good loafing cover and protection and uh, you know you want those things juxtaposed so the waterfowl can use that we can accomplish that by rotating disking in the system basically as soon as uh, perennials start taking over then you could rotate in disking to shift it back to annual and if we rotate it uh, appropriately for the system you end up with this variability in open water and structure from the vegetation. So really high quality habitat conditions for uh, a lot of species. <clears throat> so here I'm uh, showing you n normally under most circumstances in wildlife management, we do not promote mowing. All right. So that's this is a bush hog in this uh, particular case. We wouldn't promote that, especially in the upwinds, because it tends to promote plants and uh, structure in the community that is undesirable. Almost every landowner I work with, this is one of the most difficult things to get them to let go of, is to uh, stop mowing things, right? So uh, for some reason, we just like things to be clean and we go and mow down, especially a lot of early successional plants that look messy and that's uh, not a good thing. And notice in this picture, you can see all that thatch behind it. There's not any bare ground like there would be with disking and the plants, you know, that, that really promotes a lot of perennial plants. So you have that thatch paired with a lot of perennial plants and it's an undesirable structure in the uplands. However, this is in a wetland and we can use disking to create some of that open water and make a lot of the seed available like you're seeing in the bottom left in this picture. So this is a time where the, the mowing may be okay and could promote some things that you're trying to accomplish in the, the moist soil ma management system. We would mow just immediately before we flood it, right? So you're you're exposing, you're gonna have a lot of open water from this and exposing a lot of seed that's all gonna be on the ground. And then we're talking about, you know, a couple of feet of water at maximum, maybe 24, 20 to 28 inches of water. And, uh, you know, a lot of dabbling ducks that eat seeds will be able to reach those seeds all along the ground. It also can promote really high invertebrate production, which a whole suite of other waterfowl species might uh, key in on in that resource. So uh, again, it's really important for us to think about how to design things. And uh, particularly if you're using disking and removing a lot of the root systems that are holding soil, we might want to do that in you know, uh, particular ways based on the contour of the land to try to minimize any erosion or anything. Uh, you can see some, some designs uh, on the bottom left, for instance, where we are trying to increase heterogeneity in the plant community. Uh, these are all important practices, trying to increase diversity and structure of the plant community, uh, which enhances wildlife habitat for a suite of species, uh, particularly species that are uh, of conservation concern. You can see up in the, the top left, we have that strip disking being worked in and how that has promoted a, a really high diversity of annual forbs that were not present in that stand otherwise. All right, so uh, make sure that you understand when we would use disking during the year and what we're trying to promote in the uplands and the bottom ones. Remember, we're always trying, we're using it to promote annual plants and you know annual forbs in the upland and annual grasses in the moist soil management context. Uh, otherwise, we'll talk a lot about how to design things while we're in the field uh, related to this practice.